Did you ever work with the Moon Dogs? And if so, what is a top favorite story? <laughs> oh my God! Which which set of Moon Dogs? Um, yeah, well, you I, were around the second version, right? And then you had your version in Smoky Mountain. Well, the 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 first version was Randy Colley and Sailor White in the WWF. Yeah. Correct. Yes. And then Sailor White got sideways, and they replaced Randy Colley with uh, my old friend Larry Latham, Larry Booker from Arkansas, who was one of the blonde bombers with Wayne Ferris. So I'd known Larry since 1979 when he started started in Memphis. <clears throat> and that was the team, Randy and Larry, that came to Memphis in 83 and worked with – had that great program with the Fabs and et cetera. Um, were managed by Jimmy Hart and just did that tremendous business uh, in Memphis. So, yes, was in a locker room with them. Then – uh, fast forward. When's the next time they came in and out a couple of times that or year? To Memphis in the nineties would have been the next batch and then, of the dogs. Well, and that's when uh, uh, Larry was the carrying on because Randy had become uh, after a couple of years. Randy did the demolition thing first, and then Randy did the nightmare in Mid South. But uh, after their run in Memphis, it was Larry and a new dog. Who was it then? Who was the who was the dog in Memphis? Well, anyway, he got him a new dog, and they did the Memphis run with Lawler and Jeff Jarrett and Dundee and, and those guys. But then after that, he called me in Knoxville, and I brought him in in 93, and the other moon dogs, I can't remember his moon dog name, but his name was Nathan because he'd found a big old boy <laughs> that had bleached blonde hair and fit the moon dog gimmick, and he trained him, and he said, and I'll never forget. This is what he said to me. He said, the boy's just lucky to be in the business. And he was a nice kid. He did everything he asked. But he said, the boy's lucky to be in the business. I've given him the gimmick. It's 300 a night for the both of us. And I think Larry was getting 225 and Nathan was getting 75. But it was $300 for both members of the team. You know, I took it, I believe. And anyway, um, so I worked with him then. And, and my God, their matches were insane in, in Memphis with the Fabs, Randy and, and Larry's. That was a top heel tag team. I mean, they they could draw money. The Moondogs that I had, Larry was 75 pounds bigger and 10 years older, and, and Nathan was Nathan. Um, but the best story was when I brought him in a TV, and I said, all right, you know, we don't do a lot of – Furniture gets involved sometimes, but it's a fucking shot with a chair in the finish or somebody's going to take a bump through the table or whatever the fuck in the course of the match. We didn't do a lot of, you know, moondog type stuff. I said, do your shit on TV. And they're, the job guys I put with against them were people I had no plans for because <laughs> they weren't going to get any offense in. <laughs> but this one kid had been – he worked at a, a convenience store in the suburbs of Morristown, and he had worked some of the outlaw shows, and he was – at that time, he was smart enough to be dangerous. He said, I just want to work for Smoky Mountain Wrestling. So I booked him on TV as it – I'll put him on the, with the Moondogs and see if he wants to come back after that. And I thought they'd just – they'd rough the guys up and go out and get over. Dominant, wild Moondogs were – I'm blowing the whistle and we're coming after the Rock and Roll Express, right? But within two minutes, they're, they've thrown these guys out on the floor, and they're beating them and running them into everything and hitting them with everything that's not nailed down, and I'm blowing the whistle. And Larry Latham picks this fucking metal folding chair up and raises it over his head like Paul Bunyan and this kid's on his knees, as I recall. And Larry hit him full force in the head with that chair without the guy putting his hands up harder than I've it, – it, it, I never was there when they did it in ECW in person, but it looked like on camera that th those full force ECW chairs were not even as hard as the way he hit this fucking guy, right? And it bent the chair. And I was like, no, because I told – you know, I assumed that Larry was going to – do the Yokozuna deal where, yes, you know, we're hard on the job, guys, because we got to get over, but we're not going to cause any serious injury. No, he's just going out to get over, and serious injury was not a fucking issue. And so I gave the Iggy to Brian Hildebrand, Mark Curtis. I said, call, call the bell now. DQ us. Stop it. I don't, I didn't, I was afraid this guy's fucked up. I'm thinking this guy's dead, or he's in a coma, or whatever the fuck. 
And they call for the bell, and I'm legitimately pulling the moon dogs off these fucking guys. If so, it was a shoot on TV. The manager did have to blow the whistle and pull the moon dogs. I'd cut the match off because of it was too fucking brutal. And right as I'm about to, when I go back, I'm trying to think of how am I going to tell Larry, look, I don't care what you've been doing in Memphis. We're not going to treat just human beings that way, even if they are the job guys. We can't, this is, that's too far. And guess what happened? The fucking guy came up to me <laughs> and said, Hey Jim, was everything okay? Can I come back and do TV again? <laughs> he, he, he unnerved me so bad. No, I never booked him again. I was scared of him. I, I fucking lost his number, never called him again, and I didn't hear from him. And it just as well. I was scared of that motherfucker. I didn't want him around. <laughs> that's my moon dog. Is that the story? That's how it ends. <laughs> yeah, that's how it ends. I, I, how, could I, how could I fucking yell at Larry for being cavalier with the goddamn guy's fucking life and safety and health when the guy comes up and says, thanks, can I come back? It aired. I, I can go back and watch this one. Yes, yes, it aired. All right, I'm gonna go. It back was it was it. one of the first two matches or so. One of the very first matches Moon Dogs had on Smoky Mountain TV. If you see a guy hit unnaturally hard over the head with a fucking chair, that's the match. Now they hit a lot of people with chairs, but this was this was unnaturally fucking hard. I always loved the chaos that was like automatically there when the Moon Dogs came. I remember one interview. It may have been Thanksgiving Thunder in Johnson City where you're being interviewed by maybe Chip Kessler or someone. And you could see like there's a large amount of space between you and the back wall. And you see like Brian Hildebrand go running by and a garbage can get thrown by. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then they just, you know, run out. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. It, it's television, even on, and I learned that on Memphis TV, obviously. Um, that if the people watching television are watching you, talk and do a promo on TV and the people there live are not giving a shit, have not reacted to your presence. There's nothing going on. Then it's fucking bad. It's boring. It's, it's fucking bad TV and, and, and it's not as important and they're not going to pay as, as much attention. If you go back and watch <clears throat> the old TBS shows on Saturday night, every time they would come back from a break to an interview the guy would be standing there, whether babyface or heel, whatever the heel group would be standing there, the babyface, everybody would be standing there and ready for Tony Schiavone to say it. I'm joined by rugged Ronnie Garvin or whatever the fuck, right? Well, but if you notice mine, I'm always walking in because I would stay right behind the corner of the curtain and I would listen and the, the announcers knew they could see me. They knew I was there. Everybody knew I, I smartened everybody up gradually to what the fuck I was doing. Cause the first few times they kept saying, get out there, get out there. But anyway, with five seconds left, when the countdown was going to the cameraman I, with it, five seconds left, that's when I'd come around the curtain and I'd yell at the people who were sitting there stone silent. Shut up, you rednecks. And with two seconds before we came up on the air, I'd get the big pop womb. So every time they come up from break, I'm walking in while people are yelling and screaming <laughs> and, and it looks like something's going on there. And I'm pointing at people off camera, shut up, blah, 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 and all that stuff. So there's shit going on from the very moment they come back up when I'm out there or the midnight express or whatever. It's just elementary fucking television. And say so it took guys so long to figure out to do that. Some of them never did. <laughs> 